Today, we're starting off on a new series on Joseph, Fruitful in Affliction. Yeah, not too many people are excited about the affliction part, right? But hopefully, by the time we're done uh, this message, you would not fear affliction as much, but that you would see its purpose. This is the first of five uh, series and I'm the opening act, basically, for Pastor Happy and Christine, um, as they're going to be coming in the next couple of weeks. How many of you are blessed with Christine in the way that she's just been able to preach the Word of God? And uh, she's got a fan base already in the, <laughs> in the Philippines. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Word, and I thank you that your anointing rests upon your Word. I pray that in this next few moments that your anointing would be released through your Word, through preaching of your word, and that, Lord, we would be encouraged by what you have to share with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, fruitful in affliction. Miriam Webster defines affliction as a cause of persistent pain or distress. She also, Miriam Webster also mentions that uh, affliction means great suffering or the state of being afflicted by something that causes suffering. Now, when we talk about affliction, I understand that we are in a North American, Canadian, especially context. And when we talk about affliction, affliction is in varying degrees. How many of you would agree that it's pretty, you know, it's relative of where you're at? Because when we speak of affliction here in our context, it's either our CERB came in a little late or, you know, our, our McDonald's drive through was a minute longer than expected or the coffee, the Timmy's was not as hot as we wanted it to be. And, you know, or sometimes we got laid off, but we're waiting for our, our, our EI to kick in. And, and to us, that is affliction. Uh-huh. And then our brothers and sisters in China or in Iran... When they speak of affliction, it is a whole different world than what you and I would know about. And so I don't want to minimize what each one of us are going through because to us in this, you know, in the moment that we're going through it, it's real. And so I don't want to minimize that. However, I want us to be cognizant of the fact that it is relative. And every time that we are to go through affliction, I don't even, you know, Persecution, I, I know a lot of people throw that around. Oh, the church is persecuted and, 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 you know, with the pandemic and the government is persecuting the church. I want to tell you, we're really not. You know, we, we have people that's, oh, we're going to go on a protest because we are being, you know, persecuted. The fact that you can go on a protest, you're not. <laughs> you understand? When you say you are being persecuted, you cannot go on the streets with your placard and say, we're being persecuted. So we're really not. We're going through some challenges. We're going through some opposition, but we are not going through affliction, nor are we going through persecution. But each time that we are to go through some affliction, Hebrews 12 verse 3 tells us, just consider, this is the amplified version, just consider and meditate on him who endured from sinners such bitter hostility against himself. Consider it all in comparison with your trials, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer of Hebrews says, keep it in perspective. Keep it in perspective. I know that you have an ingrown toenail right now, and you think you're going through affliction, but it is nothing compared when you think about what Jesus had to go through on that cross. And so we want to talk about affliction today and challenges today which was something Joseph was very, very familiar with. And what we're going to be doing is going to be going through an overview of his life. And I will have an illustration later on that is not original to me. I remember somebody used it, but it was, they had a different point for, for it. But anyways, um, I just want to put that out there. Uh, but we want to talk about Joseph today, who was familiar with affliction. And our main verse is Genesis 39, verses 2 to 6. I will be talking a little faster today, so you'll just have to listen a little faster too. Chapter 36, verse 2 to 6. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. 
Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affair ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph a complete Joseph complete administri- administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. I want to talk to us today about Joseph and affliction. And I want us to bring us through a bird's eye view of the life of Joseph because it's very easy for those of us who are familiar with the story of Joseph to pick and choose, pick and choose which highlight we're going to talk about. It's very easy to, to get to the end of the story and, re- and, and realize how God brought him a true rags to riches story from, from pauper to prince, but oftentimes we miss the process that God brought him through. And so we want to start off today by talking about the highs and the lows of Joseph's life, beginning with the time that he was born. The order in which he was born at the at the stage that in the portion of scripture that we are reading, Joseph was at this time the youngest child in the family. Unlike today's culture where the youngest child is the favorite or the youngest child is the the one that gets away with the most or the youngest child is the most endeared to the parents. In their day and in their culture, because it was an agricultural uh, uh, culture, it was it was needed for the children to grow up quick and the and the older you got, the stronger you became and the stronger you became, the more beneficial you were to the family. You were able to help out more. Therefore, the youngest in the family were not really as celebrated as they are today because they were seen as those that, were, that had the most liability. They were not as strong. They were not as, as wise. They were not able to do and carry the work that was needed for the rest of the family. Joseph started off being the youngest in this story. And before we celebrate that, we have to remember he had 10 older brothers. To have one older brother is enough. (laughs) Imagine having 10 older brothers who did not like you because you couldn't carry the load that they were carrying. And so Joseph started off in a low point at this stage of his life. He was 17 years old. And basically, he was an errand boy who worked for the brothers when he was 17 years old. Genesis 37 verse 2 says he worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. And so he was the youngest. And so we start off here, and you'll see different colors. He started off low. He started off at a low point being the youngest. However, he, even though he was the youngest, he had a high point, which was that he was his father's favorite. His father favored him, loved him more than he loved all the other siblings. Because you see, Joseph was the son of Rachel. Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife. I know it sounds weird in 2021 to say that. But in that day, remember Joseph, or remember Jacob, Jacob was to marry Rachel. But because he was deceived by Laban, it was not until the morning after the wedding that he realized Laban had given him Leah. And he had to work another seven years for Laban in order to get the one he really wanted to be his wife, which was Rachel. And Joseph was the son of Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife. And so he enjoyed favor and affection that others did not. He was given a gift that none of the other siblings did not receive. He was given a coat of many colors. If you look at it culturally, this was considered a dress of distinction. 
In other words, Jacob did not hide the fact that Joseph was his favorite. As a matter of fact, he gave him something that would make him stand out that, he, that Joseph was his favorite. And because of this, Joseph hits a low point wherein he was hated by his brothers. Not only did he not do much with the family or for the family, now he's getting this special treatment by his father. And so Joseph hits a low point by being hated by his brothers. Now, big families are a blessing when everyone gets along. But when everybody hates you, except your parents, that makes for a very miserable existence. This big family from four different wives, can you imagine the family chemistry? There's this rivalry, there's conflict, there's, you know, camps. I'm of this wife and another's of that wife. But the only thing that they could all agree on was how much they hated Joseph. There was one thing and one thing only that they all said amen to, and that was, we hate Joseph. That is the one brother that we will not acknowledge to be our brother. And so he, he was hated by his brothers. Jealousy. The Bible says that they were so jealous and so hated him that they could not say one kind word to Joseph. They could not say one kind word to him, and they could not say one kind word about him. That's how much he was hated. And so that was Joseph's low point. Imagine being in that family where everybody hates you. Despite the brother's hatred, Joseph had another high point wherein God shows up to him and gives him a dream. Now, this was not just a good dream. It was a dream of destiny. It was a dream of purpose. It was a dream that directed and, and, and set, a, you know, set ahead of him what God's purpose was for him. He knew his purpose at a young age. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew what was going to happen later on in his life. God gave him a dream. And because God gave him a dream, Joseph hits another low point wherein all the more the brothers hated him. It says so in Scripture that all the more the brothers hated him. They hated him before, but now they want him dead. They just, it's no longer that they avoided him. It's no longer that they don't talk to him and pretend he's not even there. Now, they recognize he's there, but they want to kill him. And so they take him and they, they connive with one another and, and they say to each other, here comes that dreamer. Here comes that dreamer. You want to stir up some stuff when some people, you tell them about your dream. <laughs> you tell them about what you believe God is calling you to do. You're going to find, you know, haters are going to hate. But they're going to hate you even more when they see that you have a purpose and they're still trying to figure out what theirs is. And so they, they, they connive with one another. Here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. It wasn't really just killing Joseph. It was killing the dream that God gave Joseph. You got to be careful who you tell your dreams to. And so he sold them. Instead of killing him, Judah says, you know, or Reuben says, you know what? We really shouldn't kill him ourselves. After all, he is kind of our brother. So let's do this. And that. Let's throw him in this cistern, this pit, this dried up pit. Let's throw him in there so that he will die on his own. But we're not guilty of killing him. Let, let, let's just, let's just kind of drop him in there and he'll die on his own. So if we really didn't kill him. And Judah says, you know what, um, I feel bad, so maybe I'll save him later. And so they go away to eat, and they come back, and, and Judah comes back only to find that the pit was empty. Why? Because the brothers had sold Joseph into slavery. So they sell Joseph, uh, verse uh, 8 of chapter 37. Brothers hated him all so much so that they wanted to kill him because of the dream. And so they sell him to the Ishmaelites. Can you imagine what kind of treatment Joseph would have had to go through at the hands of the Ishmaelites? Remember the Ishmaelites, there was Isaac, 
and there was Ishmael. And the two did not get along. And all the way down their generations, all the way down their lineage, those two people groups to this very day are still at odds and wanting to wipe each other out. So can you imagine what Joseph would have had to go through on that travel being sold into slavery, being betrayed and being sold into slavery at the hands of people who hate the Jews? And so he was sold into slavery in another low point. What happened to the dream? God, you gave me a dream. And here I am, sold into slavery, another low point. And he was sold into the house of Potiphar as a slave. Now remember, he was the favored of the father. He didn't have to work. He didn't have to carry the load. Now he's a slave in the Egyptian's house. But yet, because God was with Joseph, he found favor with Potiphar. Genesis 39, 2-3, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the house of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. God grants Joseph favor with Potiphar. But what, what amazes me so much, there's two people in the Old Testament that really I, I'm endeared to. People of character. People whose whose word you can take truth, you you can take to heart because they are people of character who who is filled with integrity. And these are Joseph and Samuel. The Bible talks about Samuel that none of his words fell to the ground. Every word he spoke was word of truth. And that he was filled with character that nobody could accuse him of any corruption. And here Joseph Though he's been betrayed by his brothers, though he has been, he's been sold away from his homeland to a foreign land, being now a slave. But yet, the Bible says that Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph. How did Potiphar, who is a heathen, recognize or know about the Lord? Could it be possible that despite his betrayal, despite all that he has been through, Joseph never got bitter, but continued to walk with God so much so that his life and perhaps his words were a testimony to Potiphar that there is another God than Pharaoh. How is it that that Potiphar, who has no concept, who does not believe in Yahweh, who does not believe in God, who worships Pharaoh, How is it that he recognizes he may not have known the Lord, but because of what the Lord was doing through Joseph, he began to say, maybe there is another God. Maybe there is another Lord besides Pharaoh and all the other gods we have here, because I've seen it evident in the life of Joseph. Joseph did not waver in his faith in God who gave him the dream. Despite his circumstances, he he continued his devotion to God, witnessed about God, despite the overwhelming uh, affliction that he was experiencing at the time. So Joseph finds favor with Potiphar, gives him charge of everything. But then Joseph hits a low point and he gets falsely accused and thrown into prison, doing what was faithful, doing, serving faithfully, excellently, but because he was well-built and handsome, the wife started hitting on him, and Joseph ran away from the wife. There's a verse in that story that says that Joseph refused her and would not even go near her. What character? When nobody else would have known, he could have gotten that promotion, he said, but he said, I will not sin against God. He did not even mention Potiphar. He says, Potiphar, your husband, has given me all of these things. There's no one here more powerful and has more authority than, than me except your husband. And I will not touch you because it will be a great sin to God. It was not even about his boss, his master. It was about his God. And he refused to be anywhere near her. But he gets falsely accused and doing the right thing and gets falsely accused and gets thrown into prison. So he was doing the right thing, living with integrity. 
His character was in place. He was a channel of blessing to Potiphar. But one narrative, one false accusation erased years of labor and faithful service and loyalty. He's thrown into prison. What's the point? Hey, you ever get to that where you're doing everything you know to do. You're, you're, you're obeying everything you to, to obey. You're worshiping the Lord, but things just don't go your way. Innocently, in fact. And, and just things begin to fall apart. And how easy would have been for Joseph's heart to get hardened and to get bitter. But despite him being thrown in prison, Joseph hits another high point and finds favor with the, gar- with the warden. You see, God's favor is undeniable. Whether it's in the palace or the pit, whether your friends accept you or your brothers hate you, whether, you're, whether people tolerate you, or they full out celebrate you, the favor of God is not dependent on their approval. No one else gets to vote except God. If He decides to favor you and to bless you and to grace you, there's nobody that can stop that from happening in your life. And so Joseph was favored by God and he finds favor with the warden. And here's the deal with that. He was in prison. But yet his heart remained tender to God. How do I know this? He was in prison and the cupbearer and the, and the baker gets thrown into prison with him. And the Bible says that Joseph noticed their countenance. How can we all be in the same prison and I care about you more than the situation we are in? You, you understand what I mean? They're, they're, in, they're in jail with no hope of ever getting out. But because Joseph remained tender before God, he was still able to minister to the baker and to the cupbearer. When, what's the point of me caring about other people? We're all going to die here anyways. But there's something different about Joseph. I wonder if he was aware that God was with him. I wonder if he was aware that he was favored by God. And so he finds favor with the warden. And in that place of prison, he meets the cupbearer and and the baker. And he begins to interpret the dream that the cupbearer and the baker had. So accurately, in fact, that he tells the cupbearer in, in chapter 40, verse 14, Please remember me and do me a favor when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he let me... So he might let me out of this place. They were in the pit. Cupbearer, baker gets a dream. Joseph interprets it. And he tells the cupbearer, when you get reinstalled to your former position, remember me. Don't forget me. How many of us would have thought if we were in Joseph's position, this is it. This is my way out. Finally. I'm going to get out of this place because I have found favor with somebody else. And so that was Joseph's high point, having favor with the, God, with the warden. But then the cupbearer forgets all about Joseph. Joseph hits another low point. There's a, there's a writing in Proverbs 13 that says, When hopes dreamed, seems to drag on and on, the delay can be depressing. In other translation, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And for two more years, Joseph was languishing in the prison cell as an innocent man who walked in integrity, who walked with God, who walked in character, who walked in honesty, who did everything he could, but yet he was still in prison. Why? Because the cupbearer forgot about him. But even though the cup for, the cupbearer forgot about him, God never forgot his plan and his purpose for Joseph. Everybody may forget about you. All the stuff that you did for people. 
All the stuff, all the money you lent them, all the favor you showed them, all the promotion that you, you positioned them for, they may forget about you, but do not weary in doing well, for in due season, the Bible says, you will reap a harvest that the Lord shall provide. And so the cupbearer forgot about Joseph, but God did not forget about him. In Psalms 138, verse 8, David says, The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. Yes, he will work it out. But he's going to work out his plan. But in that moment of low, low experience, God gives Pharaoh a dream. A dream that only Joseph could interpret. You see, when the right time comes, you will be needed for something that no one else can do. God will set it up in such a way that those who forgot about you will all of a sudden remember you. God will set it up in such a way that he will find a way to fulfill his plan for your life. And so Pharaoh, or, or Joseph, from, the, from being forgotten by the cupbearer, was brought before Pharaoh and installed the, as prince of Egypt. And we celebrate that, and we look forward to that in our own lives, don't we? It's like, I can't wait for that day to come. You know, I've been faithful for a week now. For sure God will show up next week. I've been serving now for two Sundays. For sure I'm going to get that job promotion on the third week. This process from the dream, from the dream giving to the dream fulfilling was 24 years in the making. 24 years of ups and downs. 24 years of testing and molding of character. 24 years of God chopping things off, cutting off the flesh. God molding him, testing him, making him to be the man that he's called him to be. The Bible says in Psalms 105, verse 17 to 19, he set the man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. How many of you want a prophetic word? You see, it's come to a point now where it's like, ah, uh, when we were younger, it's like prophetic word. We're running to the front. We want one. We want one until we started getting some. And we didn't realize that the word will test you. The word will sift you. The word is going to refine you. The word of God is a, is a, is a living and active word. It's, it's, a, it's a sword that, that comes to slice and dice and cut off until you become the person that you're meant to be for the time that you're supposed to serve him. 24 years of molding character. 24 years of the presence and favor of the Lord. Genesis 39, 2, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did. Genesis 39, 21, but the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. You see, I, I want us to see this. It, there's so many things we can learn from Joseph, his integrity, which is, which is so important. His character, which is so important. His love for God, which is of utmost importance. His faithfulness to God and, and his excellence in everything that he did. But through the ups and the downs, that we, there's so many things we can learn from Joseph. But if there's one thing I need us to understand today, despite all of those things, as important as those things are, what I want us to see is that God was faithful to Joseph through and through, through the ups and the downs, in the mountain peaks, in the valley pits, God was with him every single step of the way. God was with Joseph when he was the runt of the family. God was with Joseph when he was favored in his father's house. When he was hated by his brothers, God was with him. When he was giving him the dream, God was with him. When Joseph was sold into slavery, God was with him. When he was with him in Potiphar's house. He was with him in the 
prison house. God gave him favor with the warden, remained with him when the cupbearer had forgotten him, was with him in Pharaoh's palace. See, God was with him through it all, molding and shaping and forming and testing Joseph until he became the prince he was intended to be and to serve the purpose of God in his life. You see, yeah. You see, we think, we think we know the plan of God. We think that it's this linear line from glory to glory, from strength to strength, and faith to faith. Hallelujah. What we don't realize is God's plan is not, the objective is not only to get you to the right place at the right time doing the right thing. It's that to get you to the right place at the right time doing the right thing to be the right person for the right time and the right place doing the right thing. And so God was with him all the way, every single step of the way. The same God who was with Joseph in the valley was the same God who was with him in the mountaintops. See, the question is, how do we see the favor of God? Oftentimes we think, that God is only with us when we reach the mountain peaks. When we get that promotion, when we get that corner office with a view, when we get married, when we... Hallelujah, it's the favor of God. God has favored me. Why? We say that God has favored me. Why? Because I'm in a favorable position. You see, the mountain peak experiences is not the manifestation of God's presence and favor. It simply provides us with a better view of it. <laughs> we see that it was His presence that brought us from here to here to here. And it's His presence that sustains us when we're going here to here. And it's His presence and favor that brings us to the top. God is with us all the time. It was his presence that graced us through the climb, and it was his presence and his favor that sustained us in the downhill portions. See, when we erroneously see the favor of God as only when we are at the top, we discredit the work of God in the whole process. And by default, we end up giving glory to someone or something else instead of God. His favor is constant in the mountain peaks as it is in the valley pits. It was with David in the pasture land as it was in the palace. The presence and favor of God was with Elijah and Mount Carmel confronting the prophets of Baal as it was with Elijah in the Mount Horeb battling depression and suicidal thoughts. The God who gave Joseph the dream while in his father's house was the same God who preserved him in Potiphar's house. He was the same God who sustained him in the prison house so he could bring him into Pharaoh's house to position him to save Jacob's house, of which Judah was a part of and became the tribe through which the Messiah was to be born so that that Messiah can bring salvation to mankind's house. It's so much bigger. I want favor, I want favor, I want favor. Why? So I can be rich, wealthy, and wise. It's so much bigger than you. It's so much bigger than I. The favor and the presence of God, He brings us through this process. Why? Because you never know what generation is needing you to become who you need to be so that people will come to know the Lord. It is so much bigger than Joseph. But see, many of us quit along the way. That's why some of us will get half a crown. Some of us will get like a two-point crown. Some of us walking around like upside-down crown. Why? Because we don't trust God through the process. Now, I'm not saying this as somebody who's got it all together. I'm not saying this as somebody who's, who's figured it all out, and when, when things are hard, that, that I'm just, oh, it's okay, it's the process. I trust the process. Sometimes I really don't. 
And if you're honest with yourself, a lot of times you don't either. But even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. You see, we too can be fruitful in affliction. The same God that was with Joseph is the same God we love and serve today. The same presence and favor Joseph experienced is the same presence and favor that rests in us and upon us today. In the same way that Joseph was fruitful in affliction, in the same way that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were fruitful in their affliction, in the same way that Paul was fruitful in his affliction, did you know that two-thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul and majority of those writings were written while he was in prison? Fruitful in affliction. In the same way that Job was fruitful in his great testing of affliction, we too can be fruitful in affliction. Why? Because Psalms 5 verse 12 says, David says, Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround him with favor as a shield. Psalms 84, 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. We can be fruitful in affliction because Jesus says in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. So we are not fearful through a time of affliction because we now understand that we can be fruitful in a time of affliction. When was Joseph most fruitful? We tend to think that he was most fruitful here. No. That's a culmination of his fruitfulness from here to here to here to here to here. He was fruitful how? When he did not quit. He was fruitful because it didn't look like what we consider fruitful. But as he was being cut, as he was being shaped, as he was being molded, as he was being crushed, as he was being, as he was being afflicted, he was actually being so fruitful because in those moments is what prepared him for this moment. So long as we don't quit, we can be fruitful through every affliction. Joseph was fruitful in his affliction because God was with Joseph. I hope you understand why we say what we say after every service, after every celebration. Go with God because God goes with you. There's so much. I know that that's a saying, you know, that's what Pastor Knapp always says, and Christine's caught it now, and the others have caught it now, and it's a cute little, go with God, because God goes with you. No, my friend, you don't understand. Go with God, because God does go with you, so you can be fruitful in your affliction. Let us pray. Father, God, today we recognize the moments that we have not been faithful. Lord, many of us have faced all kinds of different testings, all kinds of different sorts and levels of afflictions. And Lord, if we be real honest today before you, we have failed so many times. Oh, Jesus, we've doubted cuss, we've sworn, though maybe not outwardly in our own minds, we've said all these words. And Lord, today we just come before you. Father, today we repent. God, all the years that you have been faithful, will you not be faithful now? If you have brought us this far, Will you leave us now? So, Father, today, our hope is not in our own integrity, in our own character, in, our, in the strength of our faith, in the power of our declaration. Our confidence is not in anything that we can do or any 
man that we have connections with who can show us favor. Our one soul confidence in a time of affliction is that you are faithful and that you are with us. So Holy Spirit, we submit to the process. Oh Lord, painful as it may be, scary as it may be sometimes, confusing as it may be, if you're leading the way, that is good enough for me. If you're calling us to it, that is all the assurance we need. So hold us by the hand and lead us in the way that we should go. And help us, Lord, to see these challenges from your perspective. You're shaping, molding, forming us. Your word is testing us so that we can become the right person for the right time, in the right place, doing the right thing. Thank you for your grace that is on each one of us, Lord, to go through what you are calling us to go through. And we keep our eyes on Jesus. And we consider him who suffered much. And in doing so, we will not grow faint and we will not grow weary. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are with us today. And so we close this celebration. I close the celebration with a Father's blessing over each one. I pray for all those that are going through challenges right now, hardships right now, moments of lack of clarity. I pray for them. I pray that this word has, will minister to them and encourage them. And I release the Father's blessing over this congregation and our congregation online. I thank you for each one of them. Thank you for your hand that is upon them. Thank you for your blessing upon them. Thank you that you are with them. In Jesus' name we pray and say amen to you. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Go with God as God goes with you. We hope that message was a blessing to you. And if it was, feel free to share it on your social media platforms and bless your friends and family with it. And we also want to hear from you. So fill out the connect card that's found on the description box below and we'd love to connect with you also follow us on facebook at champion life center guelph to stay updated for the latest activities until next time god, god bless. bless you